you know, I used to be one of these people living under the illusion that I was in control of my life. And I found out really quick that day that uh, I don't control anything and God's in control of everything. As the ultrasound tech began the ultrasound, my wife had asked that we not be told whether it was a boy or a girl so they could tell us um, that it was healthy. And my wife had been a neonatal intensive care unit nurse for years. And immediately when the ultrasound tech showed some concern on her face and I saw some concern on my wife's face, I was a little um, nervous and I asked her, is everything okay? And she said, oh, well, you know, um, I'm just having trouble locating a few things. And she got up and walked out of the room. Moments later, a second tech came in and uh, she began taking the ultrasound and almost immediately uh, the same concern look was on her face. And she looked at my wife and I and said, uh, you're going to have a son. She never said he was going to be healthy. And we waited for maybe 15 or 20 minutes to meet with my wife's OBGYN that day. And when she walked in, she kind of put her face, you know, she couldn't even look at us in the eye. She's kind of looking down at the floor and she said, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but uh, my, my ultrasound tech's having a difficult time finding part of your son's brain known as the cerebellum. We're not exactly sure what's wrong with your son. We're going to send you to see a maternal fetal specialist the following day. That'll tell you exactly what the problem is. And the following day, um, that maternal fetal specialist uh, let us know that our son had been diagnosed with a, a condition known as spina bifida. It's a neural tube defect that occurs in the first six to eight weeks of pregnancy. And it literally means open spine. There are different types of spina bifida with different degrees of severity. And um, our son was diagnosed with the most severe form of spina bifida called uh, spina bifida occulta. And um, basically it's when the meninges and the spinal cord itself push through a hole or opening in the child's back mm -hmm. and flow it out into the amniotic fluid and their back hasn't formed properly in utero. And because your spinal cord is called your neural tube and it's attached to your brain, it pulls your brain back and allows the front part of your head to fill up with water and created a condition known as um, hydrocephalus. So despite the fact that my wife and I um, had some knowledge of medical issues because of her background in medicine, at the time there were no pediatric neurosurgeons or um, the types of physicians that had to be there uh, within a very short period following a child with this type of condition's birth to provide the care that they need. So we went home that night with very little information and I had never heard of spina bifida until that day. And when we got home that night, um, my wife was sitting across from me in a living room, uh, reading some of the, you know, medical statistics about the quality, projected quality of life uh, our son Eli would have. Um, and what we read was less than encouraging. We read that 80% of the people that get this diagnosis at this point in the pregnancy choose abortion. We read that 75% of children with this severe birth defect will cause an unexplainable miscarriage in the mother prior to 20 weeks, we were around that point when we found out. And if the child survived the 40 week gestation within 24 to uh, 72 hours following birth, he would need major surgery on his spinal cord and on his brain. And even if both those surgeries were completely successful, uh, we were told um, that he would never walk, that he would be severely mentally disabled, and he would have immense health problems throughout his entire life. Mm. That is a terrifying diagnosis for any parent uh, you decided that you were going to go ahead with the pregnancy. Why? Well, basically, I kind of found the whole event to be very prophetic because uh, four years prior to getting the diagnosis, um, I've been a Catholic school teacher for close to 17 years before I moved into the position I'm in now uh, working for um, one of the successors of the apostles in the Diocese of Lafayette. And I had a student ask me on the last day of school what my greatest fear was. And I said, without even thinking about it, my greatest fear would be to have a child with a mental or physical handicap because I was such a perfectionist. I didn't think I'd handle that very well, having no idea that in four short years, that greatest fear had become my reality. Um, my understanding of uh, sacred tradition and sacred uh, theology and sacred scripture was that suffering can be a gift uh, from God and that it's a gift because it draws us to a point of trust and dependence on him that in the absence of that, uh, you would never experience. And because of my profound love and understanding of the fact that um, scientifically, as well as theologically, a life begins at the moment of conception until the moment of natural death. And um, this is not my life uh, to take because um, I, I cooperated with God and given it, and it was our responsibility to bring it to term and to him, allow him to decide uh, when Eli's life began and, and when it ended. Mm. 
such a wonderful decision. And I, as I see Eli sitting there with you, and I know he's been such a gift to your life. Um, just we're just going to have to jump ahead a little bit in the story. So sure. I know when he was born, um, he did have several surgeries. It wasn't as bad as they thought. Eli, you know, you've been through so much surgeries and seizures, and you've had to face so much. You're, you're learning to walk with supports. How have you faced all of this, these health challenges? Well, I just, I say, um, I just get through it. Like I always know at the end of the day, it's just what it is. And, um, it's what I have. And I just, I just, I get through it without like, I'm so brave and stuff. Like I just, I just get through it. I don't even know how to explain it. <laughs> well, and you don't just get through it because what I hear from your parents and people who know you is they say that you have so much joy every day. Where does that joy come from? Um, I guess the joy comes from that I wake up and I know that I'm here and I get to enjoy everything in life and every moment and every second, I'm just taking it one day at a time. Mm, that's so good. And I hear that you're super excited about basketball. So now tell me about this, this basketball team that you have started. All right. So our name is the Cajun Wheelers and we're a 5013C. A uh, nonprofit. Um, we have ten kids. Um, we're um, we played a couple games. We went to Dallas and Birmingham, so we kind of travel all around the state, United States. But we haven't made it to nationals yet, which is in Wichita. We have to win ten games to get there. So we're trying, you know. That's awesome. You go. I love that. And you know, Chad. Um, a lot of people were praying. For Eli's life, you know, especially as you'd got that diagnosis and going through the pregnancy. Um, so many things have happened along the way, including the fact that he that his condition wasn't nearly as severe as they thought. How have you seen God working through this? Well, I've seen God working through this in, in a multitude of ways. I think, um, you know, I, I, he has been able to do things that medical science said he would not be able to do. But if you really study spina bifida, and you understand um, the condition he was diagnosed with, and he did have the most severe form of it. He's pretty much defied every uh, medical uh, odd that was stacked against him from the moment of his diagnosis. I think that it's definitely the prayer of individuals um, that gave us the strength um, and, and the sanctifying grace to be able to walk in that, that trial uh, and, and for him to come to, to fruition and be the person he is today. Um, so many life lessons and so much wisdom was gained in that journey uh, as a couple and then now as a family because he has an older brother and a younger brother who have been impacted by this and are continue throughout their life to be impacted by so many things um, that he's done for our family and for people around us. And I think that, you know, he's, he's become kind of a, a face in some way, shape or form um, to put on the, uh, the cause for life. He's a real person. You know, when those kids prayed for him in utero, whether they realized or not, they acknowledged um, he was a person. And before he took his first breath and since then, he has been an instrument that's made God's uh, work and presence in the lives of others and ourselves uh, so much more visible to us and to them. Mm. Eli, I'm thinking of someone watching right now who's maybe facing some sort of disability or maybe parents who are, you know, facing the fact that their child may have a disability. What, did, what would you say to those people who are wrestling through the kinds of things that you face every single day? The advice I would give him is that it's just a disability. It's not who you are. It's not your identity. Mm. What you do, what you have, what you do is not who you are. So just you got to figure out a way to put that aside and make sure that it doesn't consume you. You have to push through it and make sure, you know. I think that's probably why you have so much joy every day. What would you have missed out? What would the world and, and your family, Chad, mi have missed out on if you kind of went with what most people do and, and not welcome Eli um, into the world? Well, I think the greatest act of love is to will the good of other as other. And um, I think that's a, an objective truth that is a reality. And um, the greatest act of love in human history was uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And in that sacrifice, in that supreme act of love, he was actively willing the good of other as other over himself with no guaranteed return benefit of anything to himself. And um, if we're called to live out our humanity in its fullness, because he came that we may have life and have it to the fullest, John 10, 10 says that, um, that we need to give that to our neighbor and we love our neighbor first and foremost out of our love for God. So that's what brought us to the decision we made. And 
I have a whole second book uh, in the series of books that I've written that highlight how, um, you know, his life has impacted so many people in ways that it, it would have never been impacted. And that story would have ended in the darkness of an ultrasound room if Ashley and I had not said yes to life. Mm. Eli, you might not have been here today if your parents made a different decision. What are your thoughts about the fact that they chose to welcome you and you get this chance to live this awesome life? Well, what I think it has taught me to be selfless and put others, people's um, like life over my own if I needed to. And um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Love is kind, love is selfish, not selfish. Um, I forgot the rest of it, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. So I think the the how they how like it taught me to be selfish and put myself over other people, and it's just I think it's amazing that they made that decision. <laughs>